Chapter 262 The Punishment of Two Female Apostates The family of Mubarak was forced to flee out of Beirut during the Twenty Years' Civil War and took refuge in Amman, Jordan. At that time, the family had only one son. Mr. Mubarak and his wife Shahinas and their little son Mohsen experienced a very difficult time in Amman. Mr. Mubarak could not find any decent job to help him to take care of his young wife and little son. At that time, Shahinas was 17 and Mubarak was 30 years old. Out of the fear of cheating on him or being sexually harassed and abused by her employer, as it was a common practice in the Middle East, Mr. Mubarak did not allow his young and pretty wife to do any kind of work. He struggled alone to take care of his family by doing some hard work. For five years, the Mubarak family struggled for survival in Amman. When the civil war in Lebanon became a perpetual struggle for political power and religious strife, the Mubarak family gave up hope of returning to their beautiful country Lebanon. Meanwhile, the Mubarak family burden was tripled when Shahinas delivered twin girls. Mr. Mubarak could no more afford to feed his family alone. He was faced with two unavoidable choices either allow Shahinas to find work or else the family should find a way to immigrate to the West. Following the advice of some Lebanese friends, the Mubarak family became refugees in Jordan and joined the refugees camp in Amman. In the camp, the family was provided with free meals and accommodation. In fact, the five members of the family were stuffed into a small tent. The majority of the refugees in that camp were Lebanese and Palestinians. The Mubarak family spent another two years in the refugees camp before their turn to get resettlement in Canada came. Canada was the promised land for refugees all over the world. When the family immigrated to Canada, the son Mohsen was ten years old and the twin daughters were only a few months over three years. The family landed in Toronto City and made it their home. For one year, the Canadian government provided free accommodation and food for the Mubarak family. After a year, the family was shifted to the welfare system. The Mubarak son was put in school as soon as the family came to Toronto. As for Mubarak and his wife, they were enrolled in a special school for immigrants that taught English as a second language. For three years Mubarak and his wife continued to learn English. For some reason, Mubarak turned out to be unteachable whereas Shahinas mastered the English language and joined another school to get her upgrading to grade 12. Later on, Shahinas took a babysitting course and opened her own daycare. Mubarak's twin daughters, Samaya and Somaya, were three years and four months old when they were brought to Canada. They did not have enough time to learn the Islamic cultural values of their parents while they were in the refugees camp in Jordan. As other immigrant children, the parents tried for many years to instill in their daughters some values that seemed foreign to the country they were growing up in. For that reason when the daughters joined school and mixed with other Canadian children, their parents' values did not make sense to them. As the years passed by the two daughters found themselves being caught up between two contradictory cultures. At home, they were taught all the Islamic laws and the duties of the Muslim girls whereas at the school they learned the entire Western values which did not make sharp distinction between male and female. The twin sisters found more expression of themselves in the values they learned at school and from their friends than what their parents tried to make out of them. Nevertheless, the Mubarak family succeeded fully in turning their son into a typical Muslim boy. Mohsen assimilated all the Islamic teachings and values, which turned him into a hater of everything that pertained to the Western values. He was always angry with his sisters. Many times, he applied force to correct the un-Islamic behaviors of his sisters. Very often, he supported his father when the latter beat his daughters. Nevertheless, the two daughters continued to be rebellious to those rules that they found to be depriving them from their rights as human beings. In a home full of strife between right and wrong, Samaya and Somaya grew up into beautiful girls. Behind their beautiful and young faces was a volcano waiting for a small crack to erupt into revolt against those ugly values. Their moral characters were torn between those two opposing cultures. 
they did not find real expression of themselves until they joined the Muslims' liberation movement. For a few months, the two young souls soared into a haven of bliss. They loved the movement and served it sincerely. Their musical and sweet voices charmed everyone who heard their one-hour weekly program. The movement founder used sophisticated equipment to alter their voices so no one could recognize them. The twin sisters hoped that one day their parents and brother would discover the beauty and the joy of being free from those inhumane and terrorizing teachings. Unfortunately, things did not work the way they hoped. Before they could enjoy their youth and fulfill their duties as pioneers of the Muslims' liberation movement, their lovely voices were silenced forever. Never would the twin sisters ever have believed that their own father would pour gasoline on their beds and burn them alive to fulfill the will of Allah. Samaya and Somaya secretly converted from Islam to Christianity. Shortly after their conversion, the twin sisters joined a radio program which mainly focused on preaching the gospel of Jesus to Muslim youth. The two Lebanese sisters managed to hide their conversion to Christianity and the place of their work from their Muslim parents for quite a long time. No one among the Arab Muslim community in Toronto was able to recognize their voices when they broadcast their weekly programs. Their conversion out of Islam and their work with the Muslims' liberation movement went concealed until one of the two sisters revealed this information to her Muslim boyfriend. Her intention was to win her lover to her side. She wanted him to experience the joy of being set free from the prison of Islam. Moreover, she did not want to marry someone who was still entangled in those Islamic tyrannical beliefs and practices. The lover was outraged and threatened to break the relationship and expose her if she would not convert back to Islam and stop working for such an anti-Islamic movement. The girl refused to yield to his threats and told him she was prepared to die for her noble cause. In an indescribable rage, the boy told his girlfriend that he was going to inform the entire Muslim community in Toronto and her parents too. When the girl discovered that she made a grievous mistake, she shared her problem with her sister. Her sister did not give her any wise advice but told her to ignore the boy's threats. Moreover, instead of sharing the problem with other employees of the radio the two sisters decided to keep it to themselves. Sadly, the boyfriend betrayed his girlfriend and her sister. He told their father what his two daughters have done and where they work. When the father heard that his daughters have forsaken Islam and became Christians he could not believe his ears. And when he learned that they are working for an anti-Islamic radio program, his heart escaped a few beats. Therefore, the betrayal resulted in a brutal murder of the twin sisters. The outraged Muslim father killed his daughters in a cold-blooded fashion. He murdered them in a brutal way by burning them with fire. He bought a large quantity of gasoline and poured it on their beds while they were sleeping. Then he set their bodies on fire and locked their room from without. The gasoline cooked the flesh of the two victims as if someone cooked the meat of slaughtered animals. When the police came to arrest the father, his son and the brother of the two victims tried to prevent them and told them that his father did the right thing and should not be arrested. The brother was arrested and charged with obstruction of justice. When the police interrogated the father, he said he killed his daughters because they became apostates. He said it was the punishment that the Sharia law prescribed to any apostate out of Islam. He further said that since Canada did not follow the Sharia law he felt it was his religious obligation as a father to apply the Islamic law on his rebellious and apostatized daughters. The Muslim community in Toronto did not condemn the murder of the two apostatized sisters but condemned the manner in which the father heartlessly killed his daughters. However, some Muslim leaders in Canada argued that killing an apostate from Islam was an undeniable punishment based on authentic hadith and hence no Muslim could deny it unless he rejected the teachings of his Prophet. According to them, it had never happened in the history of Islam that an apostate was burned with fire. Therefore, the Muslim leaders likewise condemned the manner in which the father of the Toronto girls murdered his daughter. Nevertheless, some non-Muslim writers showed two evidences from the examples of the so-called rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr and Ali, that apostates from Islam were burned with fire. 
The first caliph, Abu Bakr al-Sadiq, used to tell those whom he sent to fight the apostatized tribes, call them to re-embrace Islam, if they refuse, do not spare anyone of them. Burn them with fire, kill them with force, and take the women and children, Al-Tabari, Part 2, Pages 258-272 About the fourth caliph, Ali ibn Abi Talib, narrated Ikrama, some apostates were brought to Ali and he burnt them. Sahih al-Bakari, Part 9, Hadith number 59 a man from the tribe of Bani Ijl became a Christian. They brought him to Ali chained in irons. Ali talked to him for a long time. The man said to him, I know that Jesus is the Son of God. Ali stood up and stepped on him. When the people saw that, they too, stood up and stepped on him. Then Ali told them, Kill him. They killed him. Then Ali ordered them to burn him. Ibn Hazm, Part 11, Page 190 Another Muslim apostatized and became a Christian. Ali ordered him to repent but he refused. Ali killed him and did not deliver his corpse to his family. They offered him a lot of money, to do so, but Ali refused and burned the corpse, Ibn Hazm, Part 11, Page 190